very very good afternoon ladies and gentlemen and uh, thank you for uh, joining this webinar which uh, dhruva advisors has organized uh, in conjunction with fiki in the last several several months one has seen a lot of action happening on the international tax side whether it is on account of a uh, pillar 2 pillar 1 postponement etc new guidelines coming out from oecd but we haven't had too much of action really on the domestic side and cbdt did not want to be left behind so here we have a circular issued by the cbdt under section 194r of the income tax act we are all aware of course that uh, uh, section 284 has been on the statute for many many years uh, it speaks about taxation of any benefit or amenity provided by by a uh, 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 a person who's carrying on any business or profession and the question was how do you value such a benefit and how does it get reported and how does the tax office capture transactions which give rise to a benefit under section 284 and cbdt came out with circular under section 194r to provide for so 194r itself first of all provided for withholding obligations under 194r2 we had an ability a power granted to cbdt to come out with a circular for the removal of difficulties such circular to be placed before the parliament and now cbdt has come out with this circular the circular of course being effective for transactions after 1st july and the circular has undoubtedly aroused a degree of conversation generated its own fair share of controversy uh, because it speaks about number of things which probably go far beyond what 284 envisages uh, far beyond what one would regard legitimately as for removal of difficulties and we thought it was only appropriate given the widespread impact of this circular on virtually every single taxpayer and given the fact that it is a withholding requirement where if you do not withhold there could be implications under section 201 there could potentially be in certain circumstances implications under 40a 1a etc that we do this uh, uh, seminar webinar uh, talking about interpret the circular so over the next about an hour uh, my colleagues uh, uh, ajay and uh, uh, umesh will sort of deal with the circular talk about the various issues which practically arise in the interpretation of the circular clearly the circular applicability has to be seen in the light of business realities nobody sitting in a, a air conditioned room can envisage all circumstances however ever since the circular has come out we have had numerous calls from clients who have looked at broadly how it impacts many many organizations and we thought it is important for us to share with you our our thoughts on the subject more important after all of that is done we thought it was important that we come up with a way forward we come and tell you what is it that is required to be done by each taxpayer as we go forward and what role potentially fiki can pay play in this whole regard so i turn over to um, Uh, Ajay and Umesh uh, to take you to the provisions of the circular, and then we'll talk about the implications or the open issues and what is the way forward. Uh, Ajay, Umesh, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Dinesh. Uh, good evening, everybody. So, before getting into the guidelines that have been issued by the CBDT, uh, what Umesh and I thought uh, would be good is to just sort of lay the context uh, of the section 194 R. and also the provisions under which or the powers under which the uh, cbdt has actually issued these uh, guidelines so as most of us would know by now 194 r was introduced by the finance act 2022 comes into effect from 1st july 2022 provides for deduction of tax at source at the rate of 10% on any benefit or purpose that is provided so the nature of payment on which or the act which attracts tds is the provision of a benefit or a purpose and that has to arise from business or exercise of profession of the recipient what this means omesh uh, and i will discuss as we go forward it applies to any payer 
uh, which is anybody other than an individual HUF who's subject to uh, uh, tax audit. Uh, and therefore it applies pretty much to everyone other than people who are getting less than uh, 10 million in case of business and 5 million in case of profession as their gross receipts. The pay has to be only a resident of India and the TDS rate is 10%. And the timing of deduction is it needs to be done before you provide the benefit of the perquisite. Now the effective date is 1st July and the threshold is 20,000 per year per recipient. And so the 20,000, the way it is to be computed is that you will take for the full financial year 22-23, which is starting April 1. Uh, and then you will deduct tax only on those perquisites and benefits which are provided after 1st July. So for the purpose of computing the threshold, you will take the full financial year, but the TDS applies only after 1st July. Uh, the explanatory memorandum and the budget speech, the stated intent of this section is really to widen and deepen the tax base because the government believes that in many cases, the recipient does not report some of these benefits which are obtained in the tax return and therefore not offering it to tax, which is the reason they have brought in a provision of uh, TDS on this. The guidelines are issued under a particular section and where those power come is really section 194R, subsection 2 empowers the CBDT uh, to issue guidelines for the purpose of removing any difficulty. And the guidelines once laid before each house of the parliament will be binding on the revenue as well as the person providing any benefit or perquisite. Therefore, very important to note that these are guidelines issued under 194R2 and not under section 119, which is the normal section used by the CBDT and from where the CBDT draws power to issue other circulars. What this means, we'll uh, just uh, hear it from Umesh in a few minutes. The liability to deduct tax is on the person responsible for providing the benefit. In case of a company, it's the company or the principal officer. In other cases, it's the person who's providing. The recipient may still be able to take a different view as far as taxability or valuation is concerned. These are only TDS provisions. And once a TDS is done, thereafter the taxability and the primary liability of this, even in excess of 10%, wherever it is applicable, will be in the hands of the recipient. These provisions are applicable to charitable institutions and government entities. One last point on the basic structure and how the provisions work. If the TDS is to be borne by the payer, then would have to be grossed up. And of course, we'll have to remember if higher rates apply uh, with the you know permanent account numbers not being there. Uh, I'll just let uh, request uh, Umesh to take us through what these guidelines mean, what's the interpretation, uh, whether the power drawn by CBDT is right, etc. Yeah, thank you, Ajay. Uh, very good evening, friends. And uh, Ajay has already touched upon that these guidelines have been framed pursuant to subsection 2 of uh, 194R. And as we all understand, 194R2 is basically brought on the statute to enable the government to remove difficulty. But as we scan through the circular, and if we look at the fine prints, uh, it appears that the circular seems to have gone uh, wider than uh, for the purpose of removing difficulty. And therefore, the question uh, that's, good, that's up before us is that, is the circular trying to remove difficulty in interpretation versus removal of difficulty in implementation? Uh, to us, it appears that the circular, the power is only to remove difficulty in implementation. Uh, interpretation is something which is left to the courts. And therefore, to the extent the circular is widening the scope of section 194R, uh, it, may be, it may be held to be outside the powers. And therefore, it could be liable for challenge uh, uh, at an appropriate forum. Uh, so I will really don't want to take you through the technicalities, but it appears that you know to the extent the cir circular is uh, widening the scope of the section, uh, then, then it could be uh, ultra wires the powers of the CBDT and therefore liable uh, for challenge. Yeah, Ajay. Or I, let, let me take up this, this particular aspect as well. So when we look at the applicability of section uh, of the circular, uh, 
the memorandum clearly makes a reference to 28.4. And as Dinesh said, 28.4 has been on the statute for uh, many years. There was a perception on the part of the government that there are a lot of benefits which are being provided in kind. And these benefits are not coming uh, within the tax stream uh, of the recipients. And therefore, to, to try and possibly tackle these benefits which are being given in kind, uh, a, a TDS provision is introduced, and all we we all know that you know once a TDS provision is introduced, uh, there is an imprint that is created, and and that helps the tax department uh, to keep a tab on on all of these. Now, when we look at 194R, you know there are four important aspects that come to light. Number one is that there has to be a benefit or perquisite, which has to be uh, either convertible into money or not. And I think each of these terms are uh, relevant. Uh, it has to arise from the business. And, and uh, I think each of these terms will have some implications in terms of how we interpret the section. So when we look at what is the meaning of benefit or perquisite, uh, some of these terms have been used in the context of employer-employee relationship. Uh, widely, we know what a, what a perquisite is. Uh, Amongst the two, perquisite is much easier to define because it's it's an amenity which is provided or an obligation of the recipient which has been discharged by the payer directly. So perquisite uh, doesn't seem to be very complicated to define, but what is a benefit uh, can be a very, very complicated uh, situation. As we go through some of the case laws that have uh, discussed what benefit is uh, in the context of uh, two into bracket 24, four in the context of a charitable trust where, you know, if the trust is providing benefit to the trustees or specified person, then it is liable for disqualification. So some of the principles that come to mind is that benefit has to be an advantage that is derived by a person over and above what he was ordinarily expected to receive from the transaction. Uh, it has to be in the nature of income. And Therefore, whether notional items could be covered within the within the meaning of benefit or perquisite, I think courts have taken a view that you know notional items cannot be. Uh, so, look at a situation where a parent has a subsidiary and parent advances an interest-free loan to the subsidiary. Uh, whether that can be regarded as a benefit will be a mixed question of uh, fact and law. Uh, both the terms benefit and perquisite have to be read together. They derive. Uh, color from each other and therefore uh, the principles that are applicable for determining whether it is a perquisite to some extent will also apply uh, in, in trying to understand what the term uh, benefit is. So anything which is abstract, notional, uh, not real uh, may not be regarded as benefit. Uh, the next important term uh, is and, and just one other point on, on the uh, benefit perquisite. Uh, with whose perspective we have to see whether it's a benefit or perquisite. Clearly, uh, not from the giver's perspective, but from the recipient's perspective, because uh, whether something is benefit or not has to be checked from the perspective of the uh, of the recipient. Uh, the other important term, uh, which is very very uh, crucial, is that it has to be arising from the business. And I think these. You know, these are the issues on which we will require uh, a, a little detailed analysis on the facts to understand whether the, the benefit is arising from the business or exercise of a profession. So if it's a salaried employee, uh, clearly 194R is not applicable because a salaried employee, barring a situation which we will deal with later, uh, in the case of a salaried employee, 194R may not have any application. Now to understand that whether it is arising from a business, uh, some of the principles that uh, you know emanate from the various decisions are that it cannot be a one-off transaction. Uh, there has to be a regular business which was which was there between the giver uh, and and the taker, and as a recompense for whatever is the business that has been transacted between the parties, uh, there is an extra advantage which is proposed to be given to the to the recipient. And in such a case, uh, a benefit uh, could be held to be arising from a business. Now take a case where uh, I am a MNC automobile manufacturer and I have contract vendors. 
i would enter into multiple arrangements with the with the you know vendors provide them some machinery provide them some other support but ultimately all of these are factored in the price if i give additional machinery to the vendor then possibly the the manufacturing charges or the contract labor charges that the vendor would uh, apply could be lower and therefore you know there is a sense of quid pro quo uh, that would be there in such cases whether there is a benefit or not which is arising from the business itself could become uh, something which we'll have to determine given the specific facts of each case some very very important principles that you know, will become relevant is that can you actually say that there is a benefit when something is contractually agreed uh, or a benefit could arise only in a situation where something is ex gratia voluntary uh, if you set some performance conditions and those performance conditions are achieved and there is a discretionary element uh, on the part of the giver to give the benefit in such cases one could take a view that uh, there is a there is a benefit which is provided second important question is that is there should there be a privity of contract between the provider and the recipient and i think all of these terms will become very important because look at a situation where you have a distributor and who is distributing products of a manufacturer and the employees of the distributor are incentivized by the manufacturer now there is no privity of contract between the manufacturer and the employees of the distributor but whether such a situation could also be covered as a benefit uh, again these become uh, very important aspects to determine uh, possibly the view that could be canvassed is that while there is no direct uh, express uh, privity of contract but the privity of contract arises from the relationship between the manufacturer and the distributor and therefore uh, it might be possible to take a view that Uh, if whatever has been provided to the employees of the distributor if it is flowing through the distributor either directly or indirectly then it could be considered to be a a benefit we we have quite a few examples where you know some of these uh, things will become relevant so take a situation where there is a uh, you know the, there is a multinational chain it could be vodafone it could be dominos uh they they have retail outlets uh, all over the india and all all of these retail outlets are furnished the premises could be owned by the by the owner but this premises are furnished to ensure that you know there is a uniform look all all across now whether the cost of furnishing can be considered to be a benefit in most cases one will have to look at you know the factual situations uh, to understand whether whether there is a benefit because if it is if it is provided that you know this you know this will be a dedicated uh, outlet for a period of 3 years 5 years then one can take a view that you know there is no benefit but you know all of these issues will need to be looked at from an overall uh, analysis of facts and the law yeah ajay thanks thanks sumesh so what we'll do uh, over the next uh, half an hour or so is really get uh, discuss the 10 questions which are answered in the guidelines uh, we've attempted to put these in a few logical buckets uh, bunched up some of these questions and uh, covered uh, and we also intend to cover certain aspects which are not clear arising out of uh, some of these so the first set of questions are around the scope and the coverage and the very first question is whether the deductor is required to check if the benefit or perquisites that are being given is taxable under 284 or any other section in the hands of the recipient uh the cbrt very categorically states that there is definitely no requirement to check if the amount is taxable or not and that's not something that the payer is expected to check and in fact they go on and refer to decisions uh that are there supreme court decisions in pilcom 196d they talk of 195 to say that these are sections where there is a requirement to examine if something is taxable or not taxable 194r is not on that footing and is worded differently and therefore there is no requirement to check whether the amount is taxable or not taxable and all that the payer needs to do is if a benefit or a perquisite is being provided to a person 
and it is arising during the course of business or profession, you ought to be deducting 10% tax. The guidelines also read with the first proviso implies that TDS would apply when benefits are wholly in cash, wholly in kind, or partly in cash and partly in kind. Now, here there could be certain challenges because the proviso talks only of wholly in kind, partly in cash or kind, does not talk of wholly in kind. Therefore, one view could be that in cases where the benefits are wholly in cash, then possibly 194 can be argued that it's not applicable and there's no requirement to withhold tax. However, the contra view here is that the proviso exists because it covers only those situations where cash is not sufficient. And if cash is being paid and is sufficient, then you know there's no requirement to cover in the proviso. There's also another thing that there could be certain overlaps here because if a cash benefit is provided in cash, it is being provided to anybody, then it could possibly, possibly be already a commission or a covered by 194H. It could be for services, etc. Then would there be an overlap? If there is an overlap, only one section applies. Therefore, you know, 194 ought not to apply and the other section under which TDS is already being done would apply. Benefit of perquisites can also be in form of providing a capital asset is something that's been clarified to say that whether it's a car, land, etc. that's been uh, provided. Uh, this leads to a few situations where if it is wholly in cash, let us assume there is an interest-free loan that is provided to a subsidiary or an associate by the holding company, would this amount to a benefit? It is clearly benefit as we understand. Then would these be liable to TDS? How would you value these? How would you account these? If these are being charged as a benefit, are we doing any of that today? And would then the TDS provisions coming in, does that create a lot of other complications? Waiver of loan, settlement of loan, there are certain aspects of this in the guidelines where they have actually relied on a ruling which was no longer the right position in law because the Supreme Court thereafter has held that a waiver or settlement of loan in Mahindra case is not really an income that is taxable and that's not a benefit or perquisite because it's not convertible into money and therefore it ought not to be taxable. There could be situations where you increase credit period. Let's assume as per the contract, your vendor has to get a credit period of 60 days and thereafter there is actually a penal interest or additional charge that will have to be paid by the vendor if the payment is being made after the 60 day period. And if you so moto or voluntarily or based on a request from the vendor decide to extend that credit period from 60 days to 180 days, is there a benefit to the vendor? The vendor is definitely benefiting, but could it cover these kind of situations because it is a benefit. Uh, similar things on sale of goods charged lower than ordinarily charged, ESOPs which are granted. As we move along, you will see that one of the key aspects that's been covered is the sales discount, cash discount, etc. And the, the guidelines go on to state that a reduction in a price is ordinarily a benefit, but because of ease of implementation, etc., uh, you know, you need not subject it to TDS. Umesh, uh, you know, if you could explain this whole question for which is uh, extremely important and the aspects that are covered around uh, sales discount, etc. Yeah, I think I think before that I would just want to you know touch a little bit on on you know twenty eight four and the right. Supreme Court decision to you to which you draw true reference Mahindra and Mahindra. Yes. Mahindra and Mahindra was directly on twenty eight four where the Supreme Court took a view that because of the use of the term whether convertible into money or not, it would not extend to uh, something which is paid purely in cash, and the very terminology which is there in 28.4 also finds reference in 194R. And therefore, there is a school of thought, very strong school of thought that uh, 194R cannot extend to you know, benefits which are provided in cash. The only difficulty, as you pointed out, is, is the use of the proviso, where they are making a reference to something where you know, it is part in kind, part in cash, and where they have used the word the term that you know if it's partly in cash partly in kind then you have to ensure that sufficient amount of tax as is required to cover the entire amount the tds on the entire right. amount and i think that is that is what is creating some amount of difficulty but otherwise the law seems to be fairly settled with a supreme court uh, decision and and just because of the proviso whether this would amount to uh, a, a different interpretation on on the scope of 284 uh, and 194R will become an important question. 
in our view it's possible to argue that uh, mahindra and mahindra still is good law and therefore 194r should not uh, extend to you know benefits which are wholly in cash but i think time only will settle on this as we see the circular you know it 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 covers uh, quite a few items but i think one area where they have uh, given some amount of uh, practical consideration is when it comes to sales discount uh, only relevant point here is that you know when when they are explaining what uh, sales discount cash discounts and rebates are somewhere they are taking a view that sales discounts or any any discount or rebate is logically a benefit which is provided to uh, the other side but in order to remove difficulty they are taking a view that 194r uh, should not apply now i think these observations also could create some difficulty because somewhere uh, in this question they have also said that only a particular set of uh, discounts are covered and therefore if if your situation is uh, other than what is uh, covered in the guidelines then then the liberal interpretation which which the guidelines have said that no tds under 194r may not apply i think that is what is going to really uh, haunt uh, the the taxpayers uh, they have clearly given an example where uh, you know there are you know against 10 items if you are uh, providing 12 items at the price of 10 uh, clearly everything is built into the price and therefore since it is built into the price uh, uh, tds should not apply then they go on to say that you know in situations where there are incentives uh, which are provided in cash or kind now if if the incentives are provided in kind quite understandable that uh, 194r uh, should apply but in in situations where the incentive is given in cash now that is going to become a, a very hot issue because if you look at uh, the the relevant question it covers three items sales discount Uh, which is a trade discount given uh, right in the invoice a cash discount uh, which usually we understand is for uh, any early payment and then there is this omnibus category of rebates now rebates could cover anything that is that's a refund uh, against what is uh, invoiced and therefore it's possible to to cover a lot of items within rebate but depending upon how an incentive scheme is worded if the incentive scheme is so worded so as to provide extra incentive to the distributor uh, then it's possible to take a view as as the question itself is saying that uh, such an incentive is is a benefit and therefore the tds uh, could be applicable so when it comes to you know rebates one will have to ensure that proper documentation is created uh, either you know the, either it is adjusted against uh, invoices or a suitable uh, clarification is made between the parties to say that you know this this is a rebate against uh, uh, sales that have been done in the in the past uh, an element which seems to have not been covered is you know when it when it comes to any service industry where some adjustments in in invoices could still be possible in such cases what happens to any adjustment that is done in done on the invoices uh, presumably one could still take a view that you know this is a reduction in in the price for the uh, services and therefore uh, whatever is mentioned in question 4 paramateria should apply uh, even to any rebates or any any reduction in the invoices in the case of a service contract so uh, ajay can you go back to the earlier slide yeah sure yeah so i think all of these items which which could be applicable to uh, fmcg but broadly to to the entire uh, manufacturing or the service sector uh, any buy one get one where you know items get bundled with with the invoice uh, those would also be it, it's possible to take a view that you know these are also discount because everything is implicit in the price now in situations where you know items are bundled where you get a toothbrush uh, free on every sale of a toothpaste uh possibly you know we need to ensure proper documentation to ensure that you know there is a there is a responsibility on the the entire channel to ensure that these get passed on to the customers because if there is a freedom provided that these don't get passed on to the ultimate customer then it's possible to take a view that you know some of these uh, could be could be treated as a benefit 
because if, if they are retained by the by the channel then it could be treated as a benefit but by and large you know the examples that are listed out here most of them or all of them uh, barring some documentation issues should get covered as an adjustment in the price and therefore 194r uh, should not apply the next question is with regard to you know how these Opposites or benefits need to get value, and I think this is also a very very important issue, which is which is going to uh, create some amount of difficulty. Uh, to some extent, you know, whatever has been mentioned in the circular uh, is contrary to some of the uh, case laws that we have on the point. Uh, the first principle that the circular says is that you know the valuation should be on the basis of whatever is the fair market value of the benefit or perquisite which is provided. But then, in the same breath, they clarify that uh, you know if the if the benefit has been purchased or acquired by the service provider, uh, then the price at which the service provider has acquired, you know, that will be treated. So if if there is a bulk booking or you know bulk purchase by the manufacturer who is providing the benefit, uh, as a result of which the price is lower than uh, the fair market value, it, it's the price which is paid by the manufacturer. Uh, or the service provider, uh, which will be relevant uh, for items which are manufactured. Uh, they have taken a view that uh, it will be the it will be the ordinary selling price of the manufactured goods uh, by the manufacturer, and this also can create some amount of difficulty. Generally, this is this is a reasonably acceptable position, but uh, the difficulty could be that you know what price do you take because you would have prices. Uh, at different at different points in time, the prices could have changed, and therefore, whether you take a weighted average, a simple average, if you have different channels through which the goods are being sold, and the price for each of the channels is uh, different, what what price do you take? Uh, should you take the uh, MRP or the price to the ultimate customer, or the price at which you are selling goods to your immediate uh, distributor or your immediate channel? I think a better view could be. That the price that you are charging to your immediate channel should be considered, but uh, possibly some niggles uh, which we will need to take care of. They've clarified that you know GST should not be included in the uh, valuation. Uh, as we analyze the impact of this, you know, if if as Ajay has said that you know capital asset can can also be a benefit, and in case a capital asset is provided uh, to the recipient, whether uh, the value at which uh, it has been considered for the purpose of TDS, whether the same value uh, would be available for the purpose of depreciation will become a very uh, open issue. Uh, if there is a corresponding income which has been accrued by the recipient, then it's possible to take a view that you know the value at which the, in the income has been charged, that becomes the implicit cost of the asset, notwithstanding the fact that the, the recipient may not have Paid a cost directly. Uh, if you look at some of the case laws that have that have been rendered in the past, wherever a, a benefit in kind is given to a recipient, uh, the circular seems to suggest that you know the price at which the manufacturer is providing or acquiring these uh, assets, uh, those will be considered. If it if it's a bought out item, then then the price paid could be considered as as the value of the benefit. But actually, when you see from the from the point of view of the recipient, uh, the real value and some of the case laws have have taken this sort of a position that the price which the recipient would have got if if he sold the goods in the market, that's actually the the amount of benefit that is uh, uh, derived by the recipient, and therefore, on, on the basis of you know what the guidelines provide. It's possible that you know the recipient may offer a different value for the purpose of his uh, own taxation basis. The case laws that we have uh, seen in the past. So, uh, one of the aspects which has been uh, clarified is what is prevalent today, and where social media influencers actually uh, get you know, products, et cetera, which has been provided by the company to advertise and use it uh, for the course of advertisement or promotion and whether that would be a benefit. One of the very important aspects that is to be noted is while they are answering this question, 
the CBT very clearly states that whether there is a benefit or not will depends on will depend on the facts of the case. And for this particular situation, they have very interestingly put it into two categories to say if the product is given to the social media influencer and it is returned, then there's no benefit and therefore there'll be no liability to do TDS because there's no benefit arising out of it. However, if the product is retained, it will take the nature of a benefit or a purpose. So somebody is advertising or promoting say a particular brand of the phone and the company gives a phone to the social media influencer. If the social media influencer continues to use the phone and does not return it, there is a benefit. But if he or she returns it, there will be a, <clears throat> the, the returns it, there's no benefit but if they continue to use it, there will be a benefit. Now, what is the time period that is to be taken? How long can they retain? Can it be contractually? There is a commitment that they have to retain. And if they don't retain, what happens? Um, absolute silence about this. So whether it should be returned immediately, if it can be returned after six months, one year, there's absolutely no guidance on this. It just says that if the product is retained, it will be in the nature of perquisite. If it is returned, it will not be. Now, the other question is, what is the time at which the TDS will kick in? If I, as a company, handed over the phone to a social media influencer, do I deduct tax at that point, knowing well that it is returnable? Or do I deduct tax only if it does not get returned and at, after how long? Uh, these are, again, things which are open. Uh, there are no answers to some of these things at this point. And then also situation of what Umesh was talking a while back about what is a value that you will obtain. What if the purchase of the product by the social media influencer is actually at a nominal price? Whether there's a benefit between the two, again, not clear. What unfortunately is happening is some of these are not things which are coming out of the main section because the benefit and purpose is not defined. Therefore, we need to, the guidelines, so to say, is actually widening the scope and bringing some of these situations in, but does not cover every possible situation around these things. Therefore, it leads to some of these gaps and doubts as to whether these would get covered or not. But at least the social media influencer getting a product, that is an aspect that has been <clears throat> explained. Then there are two other things that we will discuss. These are two large things kept to the end, uh, reimbursement and certain conferences, etc. I'll request uh, Umesh to take us through this and thereafter we'll just discuss the issues and what could be in our view the way forward. Yes, yeah, so I think this is also a very important aspect where, uh, you know, whatever the circular seems to have stated uh, seems to be a little uh, away from the reality or from the legal position that we would uh, like to believe uh, should have been covered in the in the guidelines. So, what they what the circular is trying to say is that you know if if there is a service provider uh, so i am a consultant a consultant is doing some work for a client and in the course of providing services to the, to the client it has to incur travel or other uh, expenses which are necessarily incurred for the purpose of providing these services now in such a situation uh, one would ordinarily believe that you know these are you know, these are expenses to be borne by the client and therefore irrespective of the fact uh, who is bearing the expenses, whether the invoice is in the name of the of the consultant or in the name of the client, uh, once reimbursed, these are obligations of the client and therefore there is, there is no benefit or perquisite which is arising uh, to the consultant. But somehow, strangely, the circular has taken a position that uh, if the invoice is in the name of the consultant, then in such a case, uh, you know, the reimbursement will be treated as a benefit or, or perquisite. Clearly, uh, it appears that, you know, the, the, the guidelines and the circular uh, seem to be on the wrong foot. Uh, on the other hand, they have said that, you know, if the invoice uh, for, for, you know, travel or, or any other expenditure is in the name of the client and if the service provider is, is making a payment first, and thereafter claiming a reimbursement, then in such a situation, there will be no benefit or perquisite. So depending upon uh, in whose name the, the invoice is, the, the circular uh, seems to be uh, taking a position, which, which I believe uh, should not be looked at. What, what has to be looked at is uh, whether this the obligation to incur the expenditure was of the client or of the service provider. If the obligation was of the service provider, provider then then clearly a benefit may be due but if, if the obligation was clearly of the client 
then irrespective of in whose name the invoice is, uh, it should not be regarded as a benefit or perquisite. Uh, yeah, Jay. So one of the other items uh, which you know create can create a lot of ruffles is what the next question, which is with regard to dealer conference. And when we talk of dealer conferences, uh, it it's not just in the manufacturing sector. It could be in the financial services uh, sector where you know there there could be insurance agents, mutual fund distributors. I think virtually across the entire length and breadth of uh, both the manufacturing sector and the service sector, uh, these type of conferences uh, could be seen. And what the guidelines seem to have uh, said that, you know, if the dealer conference and we are using the dealer conference just as a, as a base, as I, as I possibly, uh, you know, it could extend to even other sectors where, where similar conferences are held. Uh, the circular seems to be taking a position that if the dealer conference is for the purpose of uh, educating the dealer on the product, if there are some new products on a marketing strategy, uh, then such dealer conferences will not be regarded uh, as a benefit or perquisite. But they put a small condition uh, uh, in that. What they are saying is that if the, if the main purpose is, or let me put it the other way around. You know, what they are saying is, is that, you know, if this conference is for a select high performing uh, dealers, then clearly, uh, you know, the benefit of, of no withholding tax or no TDS under 194 will not apply. And I think this is what is going to uh, haunt the industry because uh, if you look at it from, from the perspective of, of the manufacturer or the, uh, or the service sector where, you know, such intermediaries or dealers are there, Obviously, I want to reward only people who are performing well. So each sector would have A category dealers, B category dealers, and obviously uh, you don't want to give put in effort for you know the the C category dealers, and therefore there'll be some amount of pick and choose that you are doing while holding these conferences. Uh, so just because there is a little bit of pick and choose, uh, whether uh, you will be asked to defend whether whether you know these are incentives which are provided only to high performing dealers and therefore the benefit of no with no tds under 194 uh, r may not be applicable will become a, a very open question i think more than this you know the points which are really going to hit uh, people is is you know what is mentioned in the last bullet here where they are clearly taking a view that you know if the expense is attributable to a, a leisure trip or a leisure component. So if you're holding a dealer conference and, and there is some portion which is attributable to a leisure trip or a leisure component, uh, then uh, the benefit of no with no TDS under 194 R may not apply. As far as leisure trip is concerned, it's possible to take a view that, you know, this is a reasonable uh, uh, provision in, in the guidelines. But when it comes to leisure component, how in the world one is able to determine what is a leisure component so if there is a if there is a, you know, a gala dinner at the end of a dealer conference or as part of the dealer conference where there is some wine and dine uh, some some bollywood uh, you know performer is brought in there is some some event all of these situations whether there is a leisure component will become become very very difficult and how will we you, you know quantify you know there'll be hundreds of people who are attending and whether whether you take a view that uh, there will be a computation basis the the number of people who have attended uh, again i believe that you know the circular definitely seems to have overstepped uh, when it when it's trying to uh, tax the leisure component in a in a dealer conference similarly you know what they are saying is that if if people are traveling and you are you are uh, incurring the expenses on the travel but uh, if if there is a prior stay or a extended stay uh, then uh, this will be treated as as a benefit or perquisite now obviously you know when when conferences are organized where people from different parts of the country or maybe different parts of the world are to attend uh, because of logistics and uh, various other reasons it is reasonable to expect that people will come in on the day prior. And therefore, in such cases, whether there should be any 
any component which needs to be carved out and uh, which has to be treated as a benefit becomes uh, very, very uh, difficult. And, and clearly, I think the circular seems to be overstepping. Also, one will have to, you know, whenever such events are, are organized, one will have to then suitably document uh, whatever were the proceedings in the entire dealer conference to say that uh, there, there was no significant element of uh, leisure, uh, which was part of the dealer conference. So some amount of onus will, will shift to the companies to ensure that uh, the dealer conference is not a camouflage for an incentive uh, uh, given to the dealers. So on the basis of you know the the overall uh, circular, uh, I think you know some of the key questions that are that are going to be very important for us to determine is you know what is a benefit or perquisite, uh, the fact that the benefit or perquisite should uh, arise from the business or profession of of the recipient. I think this is going to become a very very important question, uh, where there is a contractual liability uh, or a promise. Uh, again, whether this amounts to a benefit or perquisite will 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 need to be examined properly. Uh, the circular, to the extent you know, there is an example which is given where uh, there is a there is a hospital and a and a doctor which is attached to the hospital, and the manufacturer or a pharma company gives uh, physician samples to uh, the doctor attached to an hospital. The circular seems to articulate a position that uh, in such a case. Uh, the benefit is actually passed on to the hospital and therefore TDS needs to be done in uh, done uh, in the name of the hospital and maybe a further TDS uh, to be done when the hospital is providing this benefit to uh, to the doctor and if the doctor is a employee possibly under 192 and if the doctor is a consultant then again under uh, 194R. Uh, clearly you know as far as physician samples are concerned I think you know the circular has has pointed that out that you know a physician sample is is also a benefit but if you if you take you know an overall analysis of of the physician samples are not for sale uh, the doctor possibly can give it to the patients but you know he he is not permitted to sell those and therefore to what extent this can be treated as a benefit or perquisite will become a open question and Umesh, one other thing uh, that's important to note, while they have clarified these two aspects to say that the doctor and they categorically call out that this is treated as if it's a benefit to the hospital and therefore TDS will have to be done. They go ahead and state that this will then be treated as an income of the hospital and the payment onwards to the doctor will be treated as an expense and the hospital will get a credit for this TDS. Now the question is tomorrow, will there be questions on whether from a perspective of 199, will this be income on which you know, you're offering to tax on which TDS has been done because there'll be admittedly no accounting entry for this tomorrow. If your know, pharma companies give samples to the doctors, which hospital will pass an accounting entry of debiting expenses and taking an income. And once you don't have an income, then will you be eligible for credit opens up too many things. And second aspect on this is they've also gone ahead and gone further beyond what the law requires to state that even if the person is a consultant of the hosp hospital, the same things will apply. Now, some of these are clearly widening the scope and applicability of the primary section of TDS itself. Yeah, very true. Very true, Ajay. So, you know, if we, if we, yeah, Ajay, can we go to the next slide? Sure. So if you look so at if I can uh, come yeah. in and discuss about the, the way forward. Uh, so first of all, thank you, Umesh Ajay, for uh, this uh, uh, exceptionally good technical analysis of the provisions of the circular and what does it mean in practical terms. And clearly, uh, as uh, uh, both Umesh and Ajay have laid out, uh, whether something is a benefit or a perquisite or not depends on the facts of each case. And I'm sure each one of us are going to spend their time evaluating our facts to see whether in the light of what is stated, uh, it falls under the mischief of uh, 28.4 and 194R or not. Uh, there are a number of things which you might have to redo. So for example, number of clients have been calling us to say 
they need to reorient their dealer practices or they need to reorient uh, uh, the way in which they give discounts etc uh, so that they do not fall foul of what is stated in circular uh, uh, under section 194r and i'm sure all of you will be looking to doing whatever you need to do you might need to relook at some of our documentation you might need to do sort of a reconciliation between the stand that we take in gst and the stand that we take uh, in 194r so that the stand that we take in one does not come to haunt us in the other and vice versa so we need to look at all of those we need to look at our account policies um, as as uh, again uh, umesh and ajay mentioned to you uh, there are certain things where there is no specific accounting entry and there is no point of time at which you need to withhold taxes so you need to look at all of those issues which come in there the one other thing which certainly we as fiki uh, would be doing uh, is that we we'll, we have a tax committee uh, call coming up in the next day or two and we're going to discuss the issues which have been raised here uh, assimilate some more inputs that we get from many of the industry players and make a representation to the cbgt and in that representation we are going to put through two three things first is to say that there are certain items which are impossible to implement as has been pointed out and that impossibility of implementation is something which uh, needs to be taken into account the fact that some of the things are beyond the provisions of that etc is something which we are going to table uh, to the cbdt but more important we are going to tell cbdt that look if there was a circular to be issued and made applicable from 1st july you cannot come with a circular a week in ahead of it and sort of look at imposition because number of things need to be evaluated before a person can make a call as to whether tax is required to be withheld or not and and in the light of that we would want to push back cbd to push back the applicability of withholding maybe by a period of 6 months uh, as you you will recollect in the context of equalization maybe we have gone back to say yes this is a withholding provision but that requires us to do certain things which we cannot do overnight and the cbdt had gone back to say yes uh, we will push back the applicability by 6 months so we'll try and see if we can go back to cbdt to say please you give us sufficient time uh, to take care of it you would also want to table to cbdt that if the circular is amended particularly in the context of cash payments etc uh, and some of the impossibilities are taken out then maybe even the even though there are practical difficulties the circular may not be that uh, bad and we could be something we could live with etc there is of course this final thing and which is whether it would be appropriate for a chamber uh, maybe chamber of income tax consultant or any other body to sort of file a writ petition in a court uh, as we discussed earlier uh, this is not uh, 119 circular this is 194 circular and to go back and say that the implementation of this circular is likely to cause mischief is likely to co- cause grave hardships and because the circular is going uh, way beyond the requirements of the section the circular needs to be read down no court is ever going to strike down the circular but if at all uh, a, a judge might want to look at the circular and come back and say this is not for the removal of difficulty there are issues which go way beyond what the act provides and therefore some of the provisions need to be read down so those are some of the things that we need to do uh, i'm 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 very very sure that each one of you will be making those calls seeking opinions on the to be kept on your files so that if tomorrow up there is an issue on 201 prosecution for not withholding etc protecting yourself as a person required to withhold taxes you will do all of it more important no consultant can have cognizance of all the business situations and we would request you that if you could send in your mails to us telling you the telling the peculiar situations that you are envisaging where the circulars applicability is going to cause hardship so that we can build it up in the representation that we have to make the we need to send out representation sooner rather than later given the fact that the circular is applicable from from 1st july so please do send us your comments your suggestions your situations where you see the circular creating a hardship uh, uh is there any queries that you would like us to answer please feel free to reach out to us we'll be happy to send you 
responses that you have. And if any of you would like to have a copy of this presentation, again, please do feel free to write to us and be happy to share a copy of the presentation with you. Uh, any last comments, uh, Umesh Ajay? Uh, no, Dinesh, I, I think we have uh, close to 100 questions. Uh, and you know, some of them uh, common thread is, uh, and I thought uh, important to clarify that is that there are questions about uh, you know gifts to employees during Diwali, uh, employee off sites, car to employees, etc. One very clear uh, thing: this doesn't apply to anything that you have given to the employees because that will be under perquisites salary taxation. One ninety two will apply. This is only for those where there is a benefit arising out of business carried on by the uh, person. Therefore, this would not apply to any of the employees. That's, there are repeated questions on this. So I thought I'll just uh, you know highlight that. Umesh, any uh, final comments from you? Uh, maybe, uh, Ajay, can we uh, take up a few questions? Uh, we can do that, Umesh. I will, uh, there are some uh, very interesting ones. Uh, one of them, Umesh is really on these uh, uh, timing, which is to say, when will 194R get attracted? Let us assume there is a leisure trip organized for the uh, dealers, distributors, etc. Will it be at the time of payment to the travel vendor or will it be after completion of the tour? Yeah, I think very, very interesting. In fact, uh, we, we, we had a similar question and maybe I'll deal with that, that question that, uh, you know, if, if there are some benefits uh, for which a provision is already made, uh, in, in the year 31st March uh, 22, uh, whether you could take a position that no TDS applies. I think clearly 194R is applicable when the benefit or perquisite is provided and the date of provision of the benefit or perquisite will become relevant. Uh, in a situation of the type that you, you have discussed, I think when, when you enable the whoever is, is traveling, for for a dealer conference when you enable him to travel for the dealer conference i think that's the time when uh, when the benefit or perquisite uh, will be will be considered to have been provided so clearly in a situation where you know the company who, which is providing the benefit is making payment to a vendor it could be a travel agent in in such a case the date when the payment is made to the travel agent may not be considered to be the date of provision of the benefit there could be a difference between the date when the benefit is provided and the date when the benefit is utilized. And, and possibly in your situation, the date of utilization of the benefit could be later. But once it once uh, you know there is a there is a package uh, which is provided, uh, then, then the benefit could be considered to have been provided uh, uh, to the recipient. Yes, and, and also Umesh, one important thing to note, whether in the situation where this question has been posed, uh, which is a travel agent and you're making a payment or let's take another situation where a particular company is buying 100 mobile phones to be given as uh, uh, gifts to the dealers, etc. on achieving certain things. Those gifts are uh, benefits and those would be taxable. Then there are two payments happening in both these, uh, two transactions happening in both these cases. One is you are making a payment, one to the travel agent, the other for purchase of these goods. So if those are liable to TDS, for example, the purchase of goods is liable to TDS under 194Q, then you will go ahead and do that. That is at the time of making that payment. Thereafter, when those phones are given, there is another event which triggers TDS. And that's the uh, time you will do TDS under 194R. And what we need to be extremely careful is the second event does not have an accounting entry. Therefore, you know, how do you put your systems in place in terms of the first event payables knows when the invoice comes, you are having a TDS liability, you will deduct. What happens at the time of second event? That's something that we will have to uh, uh, sort of take care and uh, uh, put those uh, uh, policies and procedures in place to ensure that there is compliance with TDS. Umesh, there are a few questions around, uh, you know, samples to doctors, etc. And some of them, and I'll just sum it up because there are three, four on the same lines. One is if it is mentioned that it is not for sale, where is the benefit and how could the doctor be uh, taxed? And second, how will you determine what is the thing if it is given to a doctor, whether he uses, doesn't use it, uh, when will the TDS apply? And if those are replaced for any reason, what happens and when will the TDS apply? All around doctors and samples and gifts. Uh, yeah, so clearly uh, uh, it, it, it's possible to take a view that, you know, a physician sample which is stamped that, you know, these are not for sale. And even under the Drugs and Cosmetics uh, Act, the doctor is precluded from 
uh, selling or monetizing this. And therefore, uh, I mean, a very, very good case to argue that, you know, there is no benefit or perquisite. In fact, there, there, are, there, there is a case law which has said that, you know, if there is some unauthorized use uh, of a facility provided, that cannot be regarded as a benefit. Uh, but again, you know, the onus will will be on the pharma company. And as we have said right at the beginning, that, you know, these, these are TDS provisions and therefore the person who is providing the benefit will have to really take a position uh, because he is the one who is going to face the music. There are now almost close to 150 questions. I think some of these, uh, you know, once they reach out and we can send out the presentations, etc. Uh, should we just uh, call it a day? Yes, sure. I, I would think so because uh, uh, as it is, we are overshooting the time and uh, we'll be sort of, it, we can send across brief responses to the questions and uh, share the presentation. I have received several messages already uh, on the presentation, so we'll be happy to uh, circulate it. Uh, uh, it it's, it's been a pleasure bringing this to you. It was, we had more than 500 participants throughout the entire presentation which just shows the amount of interest that uh, this and controversy this circular has created and is likely to create in the future. Thank you so much. And I hope this was beneficial and you enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed bringing it to you. Thank you, Ajay. Thank you, Mish. Thank you, everybody on the call. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.